Hello and welcome to the Byzantine Scotist. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at Scotus's doctrine of the univocity of the concept of being. Scotus's idea of univocity is very frequently misunderstood by critics who think that he's denying analogy entirely. And many listening to you right here might have no idea what I'm talking about here. And so we're going to look at how we speak about God. So the first two primary categories we need to keep in mind when talking about God are equivocity and univocity. So when we talk about something univocally, it's when we use the same word in two different ways, right? So if I say that um, the sun is a star and I say that star all the way off in the distance there, that one's a star. Well, both of those are stars, right? But they're big balls of gas. And so we're using the word univocally there. We're using the word star the same way, right? Versus if I say that Tom Hanks is a star, and then I say that the sun is a star, we're using the word star in two different ways there. We're using them equivocally. Right, so I can't say Tom Hanks is a star. A star is a ball of exploding gas. Therefore, Tom Hanks is a ball of exploding gas. That doesn't follow because the word star is used in two different ways there. And so there's a long running debate in the Christian tradition about whether we speak of God univocally or equivocally. When we use a word about God, right, when we say God is love, that's a famous one from the Apostle John. Are we talking about love in that same way or in a different way? Now, the general answer within the Christian tradition is that we speak of God equivoc or rather analogically, right? So in a way that's similar but different. And I'm going to talk in the next slide about what we mean by analogy here. But that's the general way that's something that's neither univocity nor equivocity. We use the word similarly, but not in the same way. Uh, so for example, let's give a quick example here. If you call your dad father and you call the priest father, both, there's a similar way, right? Because they both have an authority over you. They're both guiding you. Um, but we're not saying it the same way. The priest, it didn't, isn't genetically related to you in the way your dad is, right? So we're using the word father there analogically. And so Scotus, though, says that there's a sense in which we can talk about God univocally. And so this is often seen as a departure from the earlier tradition. And so in this video, we're going to take a look at what Scotus actually means by univocity, how he doesn't actually depart from the tradition. And then we're going to tie it back to our discussion of the divine attributes in the last video, and especially the divine attribute of infinity. And we're going to be taking a look at how this ties together, so that way in future videos we can take a look at other concepts of SCOTUS using these two tools we have here. And so a term is used analogically when it's used in these different but related ways, right? There's a similarity between them. Now what is that similarity? The way this is frequently spoken of in classical philosophy is with the Greek's words pros hen, which just means towards the one. And so they're each related to one common thing, and there's a common concept behind them. So I'm going to give an example from the Summa that I think St. Thomas actually explains this very well. This is in uh, the Prima Pars, um, not question 13, article 5. He says, now names are thus used in two ways either according as many things are proportionate to one thus for example healthy predicated of medicine and urine in relation and in proportion to the health of a body of uh, which the former is a sign and the latter as a cause or according as one thing is proportionate to another thus healthy is said of medicine and animal since the medicine is the cause of health in the animal body and in this way, some things are said of God and creatures analogically and not in a purely equivocal or in a purely univocal sense. Right, so what does this mean, right? So take a healthy animal. The health exists properly in the animal. The animal is physically doing well. 
but we can also speak of a medicine being healthy. Now, when we say a medicine is healthy, right? Does that mean the medicine is doing physically well? No, a medicine is healthy because it causes health within the animal. And likewise, when we speak of healthy urine, right? So you take the urine to the doctor and the doctor tests it. Well, the urine then is a sign of health. And so the doctor might say, this urine is healthy. He doesn't mean that the urine is physically doing well, but rather that we now know the animal is healthy by the sign of its urine. And so here, healthy is used in three different ways, but they're not three unrelated ways because they're all related to the one. The animal here, the well-doing of the animal is that one. Right? So when we speak of healthy towards an animal, we're saying it's in that animal properly. When we say it's within the medicine, it's in the medicine in the mode of causality that it causes the healthiness. And when it's within the urine, it's in the mode of being a sign. So it's this one thing that's in three different modes because it's all related to one common concept. And so we should remember though, analogy, strictly speaking, is equivocal, right? So I can't say, um, something is healthy when it's doing physically well. Medicine is healthy, therefore medicine is doing physically well. That doesn't logically follow because we're using healthy in two different ways here. So strictly logically speaking, analogy is a form of equivocity. And this is something where SCOTUS is trying to deal with here because a lot of people within this tradition want to speak of analogy as a third way, which is neither univocity nor equivocity. But if we really boil it down, we see that, yes, metaphysically, we can speak of analogy. When we come in metaphysics, we can speak of modes of things and relations. But when we go to logic, there has to be a strict usage of terms. And so we can't use equivocal terms within logic. And so analogy ultimately is a form of equivocity, and so it can't be used within logic. And so Scotus wants to see how can we predicate something of God really when we can't predicate univocally because God is beyond us. He can't possibly be um, talked about in the same way. And Scotus realizes analogy is not an easy solution, because if we simply throw out analogy there, that ultimately boils down to a type of equivocity, right? We saw there in the quote from St. Thomas. St. Thomas wants to make it clear this isn't really equivocity, but it really isn't univocity either, so what is it? So Scotus actually points out that there's going to be both univocity and equivocity involved here at the same time. So when we speak about the univocity of being in Scotus, what does he mean by that? He means that there's the same concept, but not the same reality, right? So we, within our mind, when we talk about the healthiness of an animal, healthiness doesn't exist on its own. It only exists either in the animal itself, in the medicine, or in um, the urine, right? But it does exist most properly within the animal. But when we speak of being, being isn't really exist on its own. Being only exists in some mode, either within God or within created things. And so we're going to formulate this concept in our mind of being. Now, what is this concept in our mind? This concept in our mind of being is simply that to which not to be is not repugnant, or rather is repugnant. That it cannot, we cannot both have being and non-being at the same time or in the same way. It's contradictory. So we're simply saying that being is that which is not non-being. And when we talk about being here, it's not within the categories of Aristotle. So it's frequently said that Scotus places God among beings, that God is simply one of many beings. But that's not actually what Scotus is saying. Even though Scotus says that God is an infinite being, being is, be, is prior to the categories. There's not a common genus, but there's not a common reality here. Um, we're simply saying that this is this, that they have in common this repugnancy to non-being, uh, which is what their being is.
Right? And so we're not saying that God is among them. Right? When we talk about the categories, so there, Aristotle has 10 categories, and we speak of two things being in a common genus. We're talking about them being located in the same category, and usually within a subcategory of this category. But the Aristotle's categories are not within this concept of being because well, they are within the concept, but they, the concept of being is not within the categories, right? Because in order to speak of something being in a category, it must have being in order to be in a category. And so being must precede the categories. So there's no common genus of being because being is not a category. And so now we actually have a basis for analogy. So what is analogy then? It's a, it's relation to a common concept, right? If multiple things, yes, the word is used in different ways, but it's also used similarly because it's related to this same concept. Well, now we have a univocity. What is univocal here? What's univocal is the concept. There's a this real thing, the concept, which exists, uh, which it exists in our minds. We formulate it in our minds and multiple things can be related to it. And that's how we now have analogy. And Scutus actually says that all the scholastics really actually accept this idea, right? Because if they're accepting univos, if they're accepting analogy, and analogy has an underlying univocity to it, then they are accepting a univocity of concept, not a univocity of actuality, but a univocity of concept. And this is especially, I think, the case in St. Bonaventure, who formulates a very similar idea of what we're going to talk about in a minute, the disjunctive transcendentals, which he says is the basis of analogy. He doesn't take the step that Scotus does and say, well, this is actually a univocity of concept, but that there is this univocity of concept here, of being as a mental concept, which is then divided in the disjunctive transcendentals. So if this is really, though, the same idea as everyone else, why does Scotus even make this argument? The important thing to consider here is the move that happens under Henry of Ghent, who's a very important scholastic. And Henry of Ghent accepts exactly what I said earlier, that analogy is really equivocity. And so he says we can't know anything about God, really. God is only spoken about equivocally. This analogy, it's really just fancy, fancy equivocity. But as we saw in St. Thomas, St. Thomas denied that analogy is equivocity. So what's our solution? And we see here Scotus formulates the solution, which is the solution is that analogy is a blend of equivocity and univocity, a univocity of concept, but an equivocity of mode. And so Scotus divides being according to the disjunctive transcendentals. So what is this? So if being doesn't exist actually, right, and it only exists as a concept in our mind, but we know, of course, beings actually exist, Scotus is going to divide and say there's two types of being here. There's being, well, there, there's, two, there's two sides of this, right, We're gonna have, and there's a disjunct between them. And so there's many different disjuncts he lists. Um, Alan Walter, in the book I'm going to link below because I think it's very important here, um, about the transcendentals in Scotus. He found 16 different transcendentals and disjunctive transcendentals in Scotus. Right? So we have prior, posterior, independent, dependent, necessary, contingent, absolute relative, infinite, finite, unparticipated, participated, finalizer, finalized, act, potency, simple, composed, one, many, cause, caused, affecting, effect, exceeding, exceeded, uh, substance, accident, same, diverse, equal, and unequal. And then there's also a 17th, which is in Bonaventure, uh, which is unmoving, moving. But um, it's only physical, not metaphysical, so SCOTUS doesn't list it among the disjunctive transcendentals. And really, probably, there's many more disjunctive transcendentals we could think of. Um, these are simply just the ones he happens to list because they're the most important, right? So if we want to think of this disjunctive, right? God is prior to all things, he's independent, necessary, absolute, infinite, unparticipated, right? Versus were, right? Um, posterior, dependent, contingent, relative, our being is participated, uh, we're finalized, we have some potency within us, right? 
And it's not as though any side, any of the first side of the disjunct never used by created things, right? So we're prior to some things. There are things that are dependent on us, but God is fully on the first side of this disjunct. And even when we have it, we have it in a non-full way, right? So we, for example, have actuality, but it's mixed with potency. Or we're prior to some things, right? But we're posterior to other things. And so we never have the first side of this disjunct in an absolute sense. Well, God is all of this first side of the disjunct in an absolute sense. And so what's the use of these disjunctive transcendentals then? Well, we can talk about how they're related to being, right? So we say that both um, God is a being and we're, and we're beings, right? Well, what's the difference? God is an infinite being and we're a finite be and we're finite beings, right? And so since being doesn't actually exist, being only exists either in the infinite or in the finite. And so it's not as though there's a common genus. You can have genuses of finite beings, but there's no genus of infinite being because God is beyond all the categories. So now that we have a sense of what SCOTUS means by univocity, we're going to begin to turn and look at some of the implications of his view of the univocity of the concept of being. And the most important one he considers here is infinity. Divine infinity is one of the most important attributes, if not the most important attribute of God uh, for SCOTUS. And there's often said that Scotus is totally departing here and coming up with something new and overemphasizing infinity, but I don't think this is actually the case. So I want to briefly look at two earlier doctors of the church who I think have the same role of infinity within their theology. So I'm first going to look at St. Anselm. Because, right, St. Anselm is getting this concept of infinity from the ontological argument. This quote I'm about to read comes from the Prosologian where he lays out the ontological argument. And if you remember from the last video, Scotus considers divine infinity to be the most important divine attribute, rather considers the ontological argument to be this best argument for God, but it's so hard to wrap your head around that it's never going to convince an atheist. But he thinks that we can consider the infinity of God's perfection most perfectly by considering the ontological argument. So let's see where... Uh, Anselm goes with divine infinity here. So St. Anselm says, Is the eye of the soul by its uh, darkened by its infirmity or dazzled by your glory? Um, surely it is both darkened in itself and dazzled by you. Doubtless it is both obscured by its own significance and overwhelmed by your infinity. Truly it is both contracted by its own narrowness and overcome by your greatness. Therefore, O Lord, you are not only that than which um, a greater cannot be conceived, but you are a being greater than can be conceived. For since it can be conceived that there is such a being, if you are this very being, a greater than you can be conceived, but this is impossible. Truly, O Lord, this is the unapproachable light in which you dwell. For truly there is such there is nothing else which can penetrate this light that it may see you there. Truly, I see it not because it is too bright for me. And yet whatsoever I see, I see through it as the weak eyes sees what uh, through the light of the sun, which in the sun itself cannot look upon. My understanding cannot reach that light, for it shines too bright. It does not comprehend it, nor does the eye of the soul endure to gaze upon it long. It is dazzled by the brightness. It is overcome by the greatness. It is overwhelmed by the infinity. It is dazzled by the largeness of the light. Right? So we see here that Anselm has this concept of infinity in a right... There's another sense, we talked about being here as that which to be is not repugnant, but there's another sense of the word being within the classical tradition. That's the sense that uh, being is that which can be known by the mind. If you want to understand this well, I highly recommend Eric Pearl, both his books Theophany and Thinking Being. And so in the Neoplatonic tradition especially, for something to have being means it could be comprehended by the mind. And so God, right, cannot fully be comprehended by the mind here because we see he's infinite. He goes beyond the mind. 
And so in that sense, God is beyond being. But if you want to speak about God having being, which is how the tradition develops, and I think a much better way of generally speaking about being here, we have this sense of divine infinity in St. Anselm here. But I don't think this view is only in the West, it's also in the East, and so I want to look at St. Gregory Nazianzen as well. And so St. Gregory Nazianzen is probably the most important theologian we have among the Byzantines. At least the Byzantines themselves tended to consider him, uh, if not the most important, one of the most important. And St. Maximus the Confessor, right, he writes an entire long series in the English, it's two volumes, on how to interpret uh, St. Gregory Nazianzen's orations. This is a very, very important. And we see here it's often said that God is beyond being in the Byzantine tradition. Well, in the Latin tradition, God is being. But I don't think that there's a contradiction here. The St. Gregory Nazianzen speaks of God as being infinite being. And we'll see that here in this quote. This is from Oration 38. God always was and always is and always will be. Or rather, God always is. For was and will be are fragments of our time and of changeable nature, but he is eternal being. Right, we see here he calls God eternal being. And this is the name that he gives uh, to himself when giving to the oracle to Moses in the mount. Uh, for he sums up and contains all being, neither having beginning in the past nor end in the future, like some great sea of being, limitless and unbounded, transcending all conception of time and nature, only um, adumerated by the mind, and that very dimly and scantily. Now, I want to note here very briefly, um, he mentions here that this is the divine name given to Moses, is that God is being. There's a certain popular uh, Orthodox uh, speaker online here who says that this is a Catholic view, it's not the Orthodox view. The St. Gregory Nazianzen, not Orthodox here then. Uh, he clearly says that the divine name given to Moses, that is, I am who I am, says that God is being. Anyways, I'm going to go on with the quote here. And the divine nature, then, is boundless and hard to understand, and all that we can comprehend of him is his boundlessness, even though one may conceive that because he is of a simple nature, he is therefore either wholly incomprehensible or, full, or perfectly comprehensible. Let us further inquire what is implied, what, uh, what is implied by is of a simple nature, for it is quite certain that the simplicity is not itself its nature, just as composition is not by itself the essence of compounded things. Right. So we see here then, he's saying, right, we can know something of God, but God is beyond our being, beyond our knowledge entirely. It's not that we can know nothing of God, but we also cannot cannot know God fully. And he's grounding this in divine infinity, right? He's saying that God is infinite. He's this limitless and unbounded sea of being. And so he's fully beyond us. And when infinity is considered uh, to... Uh, from two points of view, beginning, beginning and end, for that which is beyond these and not limited by them is infinity. When the mind looks to the depth above and not having where to stand and leans upon the phenomena to form an idea of God, it calls the infinite and unapproachable, which it finds by the name of the unoriginate. And when it looks into the depths below and at the future, it calls him undying and imperishable. And when it draws a conclusion from the whole it calls him eternal for eternity is neither time nor a part of time for it cannot be measured so he's not saying here that god is infinite so we can know nothing about him right he says we have ideas from phenomena physical things that we have right and we form an idea of god but we know them in the mode we know them only in a finite and um uh, an originate form, right? There's, it has a start to it, but God is infinite and unoriginate and unapproachable. And so as a result, we can know him. We know him through these finite modes, but we put them into an infinite mode and then we have an idea of God there. I think it is worth noting, interestingly, that this image he uses of a great sea of being is actually rejected by Augustine. And St. Augustine really seems to have no concept of divine infinity at all.
Um, because he sees this idea of God being a sea of being as a Manichaean idea. But I think it's important to remember what is meant here by infinite being. Because when Augustine rejects infinite being, he rejects what I called in the last video a numeric or um, mathematical concept of infinity, right? That we have one, two, three, four, and then we go on. Eventually, we continue on this series forever, and that's what it means to be infinite. And I contrasted that in the last video. If you want to know more about this, watch the last video. But I contrasted it with the concept of absolute being. That absolute being is beyond the numbers, right? It's not simply all the numbers just going on forever, but is beyond them. And so this is what is meant here by a concept of absolute being. It transcends the categories. In mathematics, it transcends the sets. That's what really is the categories here is the sets. And it goes beyond that. And so St. Augustine is not formulating a different view, but he has a different set of terminology. And the later Latin tradition does accept divine infinity, so I think Augustine's use of terminology here is really departed from later on. And so we need to consider here a concept of absolute being and absolute infinity that I think unfortunately isn't really there in St. Augustine. But I think his ideas are the same. It's just that he doesn't have the same articulation of it. Because within Augustine, you still have the divine ideas, right? St. Augustine is very big on this, that you have the divine ideas within God. And so I think there's still a sense of a university of concept of the divine idea and then its actuality in the world. But they're within these uh, two different disjuncts here. And so I think St. Augustine's getting at the same conclusions, but with a less developed terminology here. And so before we consider the theological implications of everything I said so far, we need to discuss one more topic, and that's the pure perfections, or in Latin, the perfectioni simpliciter. If you want a good explanation of these, St. Anselm lays it out well in Monology in chapter 15. But essentially, there's two types of perfections. We can either have those which are limited with some sort of potency, or those which can be infinite right? And these are the pure perfections. So take, for example, being a good runner. Someone can only be right, a good runner to a certain degree, right? There's a certain distance it's over. While being wise, right, that can go on uh, infinitely, right? Because being a good runner, there has to be matter there, right? There has to be some distance it can go. While being wise, as we know, the mind is not reducible to matter. So something can be wise infinitely. It can know even all possible things. While having these physical traits, they're in some way limited by matter. And so that's what we have, the pure perfections versus those limited by some sort of potency. So what are the pure perfections? Things like being alive, wise, powerful, true, just, happy, eternal. These are all things that God has infinitely. And God has them infinitely because ultimately they're... Um, they're convertible with being. And so God has them. If God is infinite being, and these are convertible with being, then God has these them infinitely. While created things have these in only a finite mode. And these other necessarily limited perfections, God can still in some sense said to be had them, but he only has them in relation because he is the cause of these. But the pure perfections of God are infinite. But the pure perfections, right, they're still analogical. They're more univocal than him only causing them, right? That's in an even a less univocal mode. So even though it's, there's a stronger univocity here, because we're talking about them in the mode of finite or infinite, which is obviously a more univocal mode, but it's still analogical because we don't understand, right, what it means to have infinite wisdom. We only know wisdom in finite modes, that he knows some amount of things. But God doesn't know things as though you add them up and he knows some amount of things. God knows all things through one act of knowing eternally, right? And he even knows distinctly those things which he could have made but doesn't, and those things which he does make, those things which could have happened but don't happen, those things which do happen, right? He knows those things distinctly, but he knows it all as one singular act. And so these are simply formally distinct modes of that one act of knowing, versus we know things as multiple distinct acts. And we, we can even have multiple thoughts at the same time. I went into this in a discussion uh, with a uh, Catholic therapist who was talking about the um, philosophy of the mind that's available on Patreon for subscribers of $5 and up. 
or it will be in a day or two from when this is first uploaded. Um, actually, by the time it's out to the public, everyone will have access. Will have will be able to access it. So you just simply have to pay five dollars on Patreon. And you can access it. But the simple idea here, right, is we can ha we have multiple thoughts, but they're all really distinct from one another. While um, for God, it's one act simply. And so as a result, even when we talk about God being wise, it's still somewhat analogical, but there's the underlying univocity of knowing things, which is there. And so now let's move into some of the theological implications of this. We're going to talk about apophatic theology and cataphatic theology. Now, apophatic theology has sort of become all the rage these days, as it's a really interesting idea, right, that we can't really predicate anything of God, that God is beyond our knowing. This is also sometimes called the via negativa. And so what's the basis for apophatic theology and scotism, right? Because it's often thought that univocity destroys apophatic theology, but that's really not the case, right? God is beyond being in that he is infinite being, right? So God is beyond what we can know. He's in, He's infinite. And uh, St. Bonaventure describes it in the Itinerarium as infinite being is that which is in full flight from non-being, right? God is as far away as you could possibly get from non-being. He's in full flight from it. And so there's a sense then in which we can talk about God as beyond being, as I mentioned earlier, right? Being in this sense is what can be known by the intellect. And so God is beyond what can be known by the intellect because he's infinite and in full flight from non-being. And so when we talk about apophatic theology, this is really the basis for our apophatic theology, that right, God cannot be known by the intellect because he's beyond the intellect, right? And even when we talk about knowing some aspect of God, God is simple. And so there's not, not like we know one part of God. We can only either really, in one sense, know God either fully or not fully. And well, we don't know God fully, so we really don't know God in this sense. And so that's the basis for apophatic theology. But I think even created things have a degree of being apophatic, right? So even created things are, we can't know them fully. So this, uh, St. Basil says in Epistle 16, if you are not able to comprehend the nature of the smallest ant by cognition, how are you able to boast that the incomprehensible nature of God can be comprehended by your imagination, right? We can't even know the smallest ant. St. Thomas says a similar thing that we can't possibly even fully know a fly. These are beyond our knowledge. And I think it's important that this quote from St. Basil comes up in Parthenio Minguez's um, systematic treatment of uh, Scotism in um, his manuals on it. He brings this quote up when he's talking about apophatic theology, that God is unknowable. And so if we can't even know something that's finite fully, how can we fully know that which is infinite? It's beyond our, being, our knowledge. I think also when we're talking about apophatic theology, there is a very insightful uh, approach to this, I think, in Dimitri Staniloi, who's a uh, Romanian Orthodox theologian. And he brings up that apophatic theology should be not primarily thought of as this intellectual discipline, because it's primarily what's beyond the intellect, right? For what it means for God to be apophatic, beyond our knowledge, is ultimately that in our attempt to know him, he goes fully beyond us. And so it's really a mystical sense that we approach God and we ascend infinitely towards God. However far we ascend towards God, God remains beyond us. And so it's in volume one of his Orthodox Dogmatic Theology, and he explains it much better than I can, so I'd highly recommend reading that. But I think that's an important thing to remember to keep in mind when we discuss apophatic theology. But as we emphasized over the course of this whole video, there is a sense in which God can be known. And so that's cataphatic theology, it's what we can affirm of God. And this is really rooted, I think, in divine infinity. So just like apophatic theology is, there's still a sense in which something's infinite, then it has a way in which it can be known in a finite manner. So I think the most obvious sense of divine um, infinity and cataphatic theology is with the pure perfections that St. Anselm talks about. 
they can be affirmed cataphatically of God because they're convertible with being. And so they're just in an infinite mode in God while they're in a finite mode within us. And that's the most obvious way, right? And I think that very clearly there is a sense of cataphatic theology as soon as we start talking about these things like love and goodness and justice and so on. But I think additionally, uh, cataphatic theology is based on the revelation of God through the divine procession. So what does that mean, right? St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, talks about these divine processions through which God is revealed and acts within the world. And so God reveals himself in some way, either through the things he creates or by his actions. And we can know God in that way, right? So these processions are infinite and uh, uncreated with respect to God, but they're in a finite and created mode with respect to us, right, when we receive them. So right, think about the divine ideas, for example. This is very clearly in both the Cappadocians, especially Maximus the Confessor, who I think really crystallizes it with the Logi, and then also St. Augustine in the West, right? They hold that there's these ideas within the mind of God that, that God then creates actually within the world. And, right, and so we know when we see something created in the world that pre-existed more fully within the mind of God. Well, the mind of God, as we talked about in the last video, um, as that's really the argumentation for it, the divine ideas fundamentally are are the divine essence, right? They're not identical to one another, as we talked about. They're formally distinct modes, but they are all identical with the essence. And so we can, in some sense, in a finite and created mode, know the essence of God by these created things. We also want to affirm the sense of univocity grounded in divine infinity of the divine names. And this is what the Cappadocians actually affirm against Eunomius. Eunomius uh, says we can fully know God, um, but the Cappadocians, they don't. Act, their response is not to say that we don't know God at all. Their response is to say is actually there is a relation between the divine names and the divine essence. Um, if you want to go into this idea, it's a long train of thought, so I don't want to derail the whole thing by this. But I highly recommend the transformation of divine simplicity by Andrew Rade Galowitz. He goes into a lot of detail with this in uh, Basil and Gregory of Nyssa. So I'll leave that as a footnote if you want to explore the similarity with the Cappadocians more. And it's often this book is often appealed to to argue for polemism. Um, the famous Orthodox um, guy on the internet who I referenced earlier, I don't want to name because I don't want to attract the attention of his followers, but he very frequently appeals to and Andrew Rade Galwitz's book and says, here's polemism here. If you read Galwitz's book, he says at the end of his book that this is not polemism, and he explains how it's not polemism. And if you, I think if you actually read his explanation of it, it will sound very, very similar to um, what you have here with Scotism and the Divine Names, and Univocity, rather, in Scotism. Right? And so Augustine and Bonaventure, they both hold this idea of divine illumination. Um, Bonaventure really heavily draws this from Augustine. And then we have this divine names theology in the Byzantine world. And I think that both of these really are the same as Scotist univocity. This is especially harped on, I think, by uh, Father Peter Damien Fellner, um, who really emphasized the similarity of Bonaventure's divine illumination and Scotus's concept of univocity. And Scotus is often pointed to as departing from Bonaventure on divine illumination, but that's not the case at all. Because what does divine illumination mean for Bonaventure? What Bonaventure means by it is that we're created within the image of God. And so implanted in our memory is these divine ideas that are within the mind of God. And so as a result, we're able to know the forms of things because we have this divine illumination. We have this similarity to God. And this is, Scotus does not disagree with that at all, right? He says that when we see something created, we know it's in God more fully because we have that underlying univocity. What Scotus is denying is Henry of Ghent's view of divine illumination, that for Henry of Ghent, 
everything really is just equivocal, right? There's really no uh, analogy. Analogy is just fancy equivocation. And likewise for Henry of Ghent, when it comes to divine illumination, the way we know things about God is that God just directly illumines our mind. So when we see two tables and we know they have a common tableness to them, there's really uh, we can't know that common tableness, but God illumines our mind directly to be able to perceive that common tableness. And so that's what Scotus is denying. It's simply Henry of Ghent's view that he's denying. And so if you enjoyed this video, I highly, highly, highly recommend um, Father Alan Walter's book on this topic. I'm going to link it in the description below, and it's free on archive.org if you just want to read it there. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this con this very complex concept, I hope I was able to make sense of it for you. If you liked this video, please give the video a like, a comment below, share it with your friends. Um, if you want more content, subscribe on Patreon. Uh, for $10 a month, you can get early access. And for $5 a month, you get exclusive monthly interviews. And by the time this is out, the first interview will be out. And hopefully very shortly after that, the second interview will be out. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this, and thank you for watching.